Hello and welcome to our weekly COVID-19 update for the town of Plymouth. I'm Donna Rodriguez and I will be filling in today for Steve Trifoletti. Steve is with his family today celebrating the birth of his new granddaughter, so we wish the entire family well. This forum is being brought to you live by PAC TV on Comcast Channel 15 and Verizon Channel 47. You can also watch this on PAC TV's streaming channel by going to pactv.org slash live. For questions during today's forum, please email plymouthinfo at pactv.org. These forums can be replayed at pactv.org slash Plymouth. Today, our participants include Dr. I'm sorry, Ken Tavares, Dr. Mark Wilson, Sarah Cloud, Justin Domingos, Scott Fry, Stephen Cole, and Matt Moratori. We're going to start off, as always, with words from Ken Tavares, the chair of the Plymouth Board of Selectmen. Welcome, Ken. Thank you, Donna. It's uh, wonderful to have you on board today on the other side of the camera. But it, it also gives all of us a, a, an opportunity to say thank you to you and your crew that have uh, silently uh, in the background helped do so much uh, to get our messages across. So we, we thank you sincerely. Uh, my message for the next uh, two programs as we get to number 100 is going to be to get the vaccination. It, it doesn't take long to get it now. It's easy. We are almost near the finish line and we need more people to get vaccinated. Plymouth has done extremely well uh, with our older population and now we're looking at younger folks in the community to get it. This way we are absolutely helping one another. So I, I beg you to please, if you haven't been vaccinated, to do it. It will actually save lives. So with that, Donna, I pass uh, uh, the microphone on to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, and thank you for that message. And as you said, it, it is so much easier now for all of us to get vaccinated, um, and the information is still online, and more of our guests will be talking about that too today, I'm sure. We're going to go a little out of order today. Instead of going right to our medical segment, we're going to be starting off with economic development with Stephen Cole, who is the executive director of the Plymouth Regional Economic Development Foundation. Stephen, thank you for being here today, and I understand you've been, you've been being vaccinated as well, correct? Oh, we're not hearing you, Stephen. Are you unmuted? <laughs> we'll just give it a second to see if we can get your audio. Sorry about that. Oh, there can you, you are. hear me okay, Thank Donna? You so much. Yes, we can right. hear you. So, so, so for those folks at home, I am in the studio today because I did get my second vaccine and I was just down the street. I knew I wasn't gonna get back to the office in time for the broadcast. So I swung into the into the pack TV and I have to give my friend Julie a little bit of praise here. She played a trick on me, putting the, 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 the mouse just a little out of reach so I couldn't out -mute, un -mute myself. Um, <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. And for the last few weeks, I have been promising folks that I will be coming back with some really exciting news with regard to our entrepreneurial study and our programming. Well, on Friday, the, uh, the evaluation uh, panel met to review the RFP that we put out. And I'm very glad to say that the town and the foundation selected the UMass Donahue Institute to assist us for preparing an entrepreneurial study. And at the end of this study, we will have an implementation strategy focusing on a brick and mortar facility that has hackerspace, makerspace, tinkerspace, 3D printing, industrial test kitchen. Frankly, the goal of this study is to, be, uh, is to establish Plymouth as not only an entrepreneurial center, but also to understand who do we have here, what support systems are in place presently, who can we attract, and what things do we need to provide them in order for them to be successful. Uh, my sense is that as we go further into this conversation, many folks watching this program, and I know at least two of my board members who are on the program with me today, will certainly be interviewed as part of that process. So uh, if you are watching, if you are an entrepreneur, if you want to be a part of the interview so that you can contribute to the discussion and the, the recommendations, please reach out to the foundation. I want to hear from you. But as we come back in the next couple of weeks, uh, we'll have much more to tell you. So I really appreciate the opportunity, Donna, and I really appreciate the panelists allowing me to come out of order so that I could, uh, I could share this news with you today. Thank you so much, Stephen. And we're looking forward to hearing the news as you move forward. It really is exciting to see all of the work that's being done and to see what the, the next steps are for Plymouth and, and for all of our uh, entrepreneurs and residents. So there's, there's a lot coming forward. So we'll see you soon and thank you for joining us today. And now we're going to move forward uh, to you. talk to Dr. Mark Wilson for our um, 
our health and medical segment. He is a professor at the University of Michigan School of Public Health and with the Department of Epidemi Epidemiology. Excuse me. Mark, good morning or good afternoon, I should say. Thank you for being with us. Good afternoon to you and everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm sure that vaccinations, masks, and opening up are in many people's minds today, and I thought I'd provide a bit of information about this. Uh, and so here are some questions that I've come across uh, recently. The first one is as follows. Back in February, I received my first dose of the Moderna vaccine, but never got the second one because a friend reported it made him sick. Is it still safe and useful to get my second dose so late after the first? So in response to that, um, I would offer that scientists are still studying how much protective immunity comes from getting only one of the two shots uh, for the two, two dose uh, vaccines that we, that we know of. And they're also studying how a delayed second shot will impact on protection. But in general, health experts agree that it's really best to get the full dose, whichever of the vaccines that you can, um, both the first and the second. Um, and it's recommended, of course, that you get the second dose within six weeks, if possible, after the first. But if that's not possible, as this uh, uh, question indicated, experts also agree that you should still get the second shot whenever you can no matter how long after the first it's been. And so it's not necessary to start over again to really uh, repeat the first. Uh, you should just take only the second dose. And really all evidence suggests that the second dose does improve significantly protection, even if it's taken later than what is recommended. So as you, the audience has heard uh, and will continue to hear many times, I'm sure, um, do get your vaccinations and don't hesitate to get a second one, even if it's late. The next question is related to uh, this, but with regard to how long protection lasts. And it goes as follows. I am a 62 year old frontline worker who completed my COVID vaccination in January. My family and I are hoping to take a real vacation in July. Am I still going to be protected six months after being vaccinated and are virus variants going to be a problem? So this is obviously a very uh, relevant question to, to some, maybe many of us. And this issue of how long protective immunity will last is, is also being carefully studied, uh, but we're really gonna have to wait until more vaccinated people have been followed for a longer period of time uh, to have enough scientifically solid information about uh, answers to this question. And this is also why we don't know whether or not booster shots will be necessary against virus, variants of the virus or, or the same virus, uh, say, a year or two from now. By following people who were part of the early clinical trials, it's known that protection from both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines is still strong after six months has passed. And some experts are actually now suggesting that protection could last for up to a year or even two before a booster shot might be required. But again, scientists are carefully monitoring this. What's not known is how well vaccination protects against the variants uh, that are now appearing. And again, this will take some time to study. So far, the laboratory tests have shown that the current COVID vaccines may be slightly less effective in protecting against infection to the South African and Brazil variants, but experts believe that vaccines, these, both of these vaccines still have considerable benefit against severe disease. So with regard to the vaccination that uh, this person is planning, CDC uh, says that it's still best to even, that, that even the fully vaccinated people traveling within the US continue to take precautions uh, as before. And these policies of course are under constant review uh, and new information is emerging that may uh, make those changes in the policies take place. Travel outside of the US will obviously depend on the country that you're going to. Finally, this is another question um, about vaccine efficacy. It goes as follows. My friend who has been vaccinated went to an indoor party this past weekend 
with more than 30 people, many of whom were not vaccinated. There was a lot of close up talking and nobody wore masks. Even though I am vaccinated, should I avoid contact with my friend for a while? Would my friend have inadvertently been exposed to variants, even though he, is not, he has not had any symptoms uh, three days after the party? So the, here I think the answer is the risk to your friend and you is really very low because you're both vaccinated. But it's not a good scenario for the uh, others at that party who weren't, who weren't yet vaccinated. Um, I think we all know the CDC advises that when immunized and non-immunized people gather indoors, um, the people who haven't yet had their shots need to take precautions, uh, especially wearing a mask. Uh, risk to the vaccinated people in the setting is really low because the vaccine is so highly protective. Uh, other results from real world support the findings of clinical trials and they indicate that the vaccines are highly effective at preventing symptomatic COVID, including from the UK and South African variants. And there've been some new reports that also suggest that vaccines dramatically, dramatically reduce even these asymptomatic infections that we're all familiar with. But as far as this person and his friend are concerned, the CDC advises that quarantine is not usually necessary for fully vaccinated people, even if there is a suspected exposure. That said, everyone should know that it's perfectly fine to be extra careful as long as you wish. Many of the hygiene practices that we've gotten used to can be continued uh, as they're, they're going to help protect us from other respiratory infections such as colds and flu uh, long into the future. So let me stop there and I'd be happy to answer any questions that viewers might have later on in the program. Thank you. Dr. Wilson, thank you so much. It really is incredibly helpful to be hearing real world everyday questions and answers too, because so many folks still have questions. We're learning every single day. And just to remind our viewers that um, if you have questions that you would like any of our experts to answer, please email them to PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org and we will be happy to get to them later in the show. So we invite you to send your questions in at any time. Again, thank you, Dr. Wilson. And now we're gonna be able, we're gonna be moving on to Sarah Cloud, who is the Director of Behavioral Health and Social Work at Beth Israel Deaconess here in Plymouth. Welcome, Sarah, how are you today? Good, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and I, so, you know, in keeping with the other guests um, talking today on the show, you know, I, I really just want to, um, you know, as our community continues to reopen and we edge towards herd immunity, I really just want to make sure we caution um, that we don't take our focus off our collective well being. And that's both the emotional and physical aspects alike. And social isolation and changes in our routine have had a great impact on all members of our community, but especially the seniors. It's been well established that social isolation is associated with an increase in risk of developing dementia by as much as 50%, coronary heart disease, and the chances of having a stroke. Social isolation is also associated with increased depression, anxiety, and poorer cognitive functioning. So while we enjoy uh, the reunions with our friends and families that being vaccinated has allowed us to do, and as we watch the really feel good stories that are highlighted on the media, we should continue to keep a vigilant watch of our senior loved ones and our senior neighbors. Keep in mind that many seniors are afraid to ask for help or may need more support than they're willing to admit. So a few ideas for how we can help seniors feel cared about can include scheduling a daily or weekly phone call to the person, something that they can look forward to, arranging for a visit outside for some fresh air as the weather becomes increasingly beautiful and warmer. Um, and during these interactions, we wanna see if we can inquire about how their appetite and sleep patterns and moods have been. So those can often be indications of some red flags and things that we need to, maybe they need some additional support or, or intervention. Um, we really wanna help support them in reconnecting with the healthcare providers if they haven't done so already. And that may include trying to help them schedule and have access to a vaccination or maybe help them find answers to the questions they may have. Um, it's also really important to encourage the person to share their wisdom and to feel, feel valued. 
Um, dropping off a meal once in a while or several times a week can also be a nice treat or way to make them feel loved and cared about and remembered. Offering to help with a pet um, to ease the burden of the company that they do have. Um, or ordering uh, pictures or photos um, for on-site, um, off-site printing um, look, you know, websites that can be sent directly or mailed directly to the individual. And lastly, um, engage in unprompted acts of kindness. For example, a bouquet of spring flowers from the garden or hanging a birdhouse or a feed or something for them to watch and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Again, we appreciate your time and your input. And you're right, as, as we move forward, it is still so important to, to remember to assist those around us who do need that contact and need that connection. So thank you, thank you for your time, and we'll be back to you with some questions in a few minutes. Now we're going to be moving into our education section, and uh, today we have the athletic directors from both Plymouth North and Plymouth South High School uh, here to speak with us. We're going to be starting with Plymouth North High School with Justin Domingos. Justin, how are you today? Welcome. I'm great. Thank you for having me. Uh, we're, we're excited. We are back up and running uh, student bodies full capacity at both North and South high schools. We kicked off our spring sport slate uh, two weeks ago and started competing at the end of last week um, with our traditional spring sports offering. We're also, we've also, the MIA has shifted some winter sports over. So we're, we're competing in wrestling starting today at both North and South. And we're offering cheer and dance as well. So a, a little different flavor to our spring sports, but, uh, Everybody's up and running, baseball, lacrosse, tennis, track and field. Our unified track and field programs are going to start competing next week. Uh, dance and cheer will we'll compete in virtual competitions. And at the end of May, we're going to hold a Patriot League Cup tournament with all the teams in the Patriot League Cup. All 12 teams will compete in each sport. And then uh, starting the week of June 14th, we're going to be able to opt all of our teams in this year to the MIA state tournament. So we'll be competing at a state level in all of our sports too. So really exciting time here in the spring. Our, our athletes are still wearing masks while they compete and uh, doing a great job with that. I think the vigilance is key there as you know we do in, in a lot of our sports, lacrosse, baseball, softball, we can be in some close contact situations. So our athletes are continuing to mask up and, and doing a great job there, um, staying vigilant with that. So thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And now we're going to be moving on to Plymouth South High School. We're going to be talking to Scott Fry. Welcome, Scott. What would you like to offer us from Plymouth South today? Um, again, Donna, thank you for having me. I'm going to try not to copy some of the things that, um, that Justin said. But again, my name is Scott Fry. I've been the AD for about 15 years at Plymouth South. Just like Justin, we are extremely excited to have everyone back in school. Um, it's great to see the, the hallways filled and the, and the fields um, with plenty of kids in there. Um, we are entering, just like Justin, a fourth season um, of sports with 11 sports um, with over 400 student athletes participating. You know, there's been some challenges, no question about it, but it certainly has been worth it. Um, I'll tell you what, our players and coaches and parents have been really incredible, incredibly positive, flexible, and really, really patient. Um, there's been some towns and some schools that have, that have canceled sports and, and actually canceled seasons. But in Plymouth and in the Patriot Week League, we have um, we've completed all of our seasons following EEA guidelines. Um, we've actually just finished football in February. And just like Justin, we're actually wrestling right now in the spring. So things are a little bit different. But um, as I drove out of Plymouth South High School yesterday in a beautiful campus that we have, and how lucky we have such a, an unbelievable facility. And I look out in the fields and I see 400 kids running around in the fields doing it safely with masks on. Um, I realize how lucky we are considering where we were a year ago. So again, Donna, thank you for having me. Thank you. And as a parent of a, a student, two students in the Plymouth Public Schools, uh, I can say how happy my family is and my children are for being back and, and being able to be on their campuses. So it's wonderful to have everybody back at school and be able to bring all of these social and recreational activities back for our kids. So thank you both. Um, we're going to be skipping out of order as we had already had Stephen Cole speak, and we're going to be going to our state representative, Matt Moratori, to tell us what's going on at the state level. Matt, welcome. I hope you're doing well today. Yeah, Donna, it's great, great. Thanks for having me. And Donna, thank you for uh, pinch hitting today and uh, really for everything you and the whole staff of PAC TV has, uh, has been doing for all almost 100 shows now. So we we do appreciate that. And I want to I want to echo what you also said, Donna, with regard to having um, 
students in the school system. I have three students in the school system. And it's so great to see them being active and doing things now. And I agree with Scott. I, I drive up to Plymouth South High School the other day and saw all the fields just filled with kids running around and doing all sorts of sports. Just, just great to see. And then the Plymouth schools have done a tremendous job. Um, there are towns, as Scott had indicated, that have not done uh, what Plymouth has done. But uh, again, Plymouth is you know always about the students and how do we make it happen for the students. And I applaud all the administration, the teachers and the staff for that. Um, real quickly, uh, we have some milestones today uh, that we've hit. So we've, we've received over 8,000 doses um, as of yesterday. So we've hit that mark. We're at 8,172,000, doses we received uh, since the beginning of started getting the vaccinations. Uh, for the first time um, since uh, June 30th of 2020, there were no deaths yesterday. Um, that is, that's only happened three times that the pandemic started. The first time it happened was back in March when we recorded the first death. The next day, there were no deaths recorded. Uh, and then the next one was June 30th. So that's a, that's a great milestone to, to have. We've also hit a milestone. We vaccinated over 3 million people as of yesterday in a column, fully vaccinated. So, uh, and our goal again is to hit 4.1 million and we should be hitting that um, somewhere around uh, the end of May. Um, the 1 million vaccination, fully vaccinated March, um, um, fully vaccinated uh, goal we reached was on March 19th. 2 million people, we reached that fully vaccinated goal on April 17th um, and we're vaccinating somewhere around 40 to 50,000 people a day. So by the end of, uh, end of May, 1st of June, we should see over 4 million people fully vaccinated in the Commonwealth. And as we talked about the last time, Donna, uh, we were looking at uh, bringing it into the communities and we're, we're seeing more and more of that now. Um, less and less having to make appointments and more and more just going where it's convenient to go to get the vaccination uh, and get it on the spot if you're at CVS or Walgreens or Walmart or uh, going to your doctor's office, et cetera. So we're trying to make it as accessible as possible so we can get more and more people uh, vaccinated. Uh, so just to, to run a little bit more on those on those numbers, um, 6.9 million total doses have been administered out of the 8.1 million, which is 83, 84% um, into the arms that we've done, which is the second best in the whole country. Um, we've also, um, so out of that 3.9 or 3.9 million first doses, 2.8 second doses and 225,000 of the J&J, &J, which as you know, is a one shot. With regard to the, the COVID cases, those are dropping as well there for five days in a row, they've been under uh, 1,000. Um, so we're, we're running, uh, the number of COVID cases yesterday was a little over 400. Uh, confirmed cases since last March of 2020, uh, 654,000. The total deaths since March of 2020 was 17,344, but again, that's slowing down drastically. Um, but again, five days in a row being under 1,000. The seven-day positivity rate of COVID cases is still running under 1.5. It's at 1.32. Uh, and the active cases continue to drop. And I think I mentioned this last week. I think by the time we end our, we get to our 100th show, our last show, we'll probably see this in, in the few thousands. But right now, the active COVID cases in Massachusetts is at 17,500 and dropping. The hospitalizations are still around the same. They're still relatively low, but they're still around the same, about 440. Uh, with 117 uh, of those folks being in the ICU and unfortunately 76 on ventilators. Um, one little fun fact of May 10th, I started the new phase, phase four, step two, um, but grocery stores no longer have to um, um, have to have special hours. Uh, I remember they were doing special hours in the beginning of the day for those over the age of 60 and compromised people. They no longer need to do that, but we are, are asking them to please continue to do that if they can, but they are not required to do that. So uh, so that's the update, Donna. Again, we are in step uh, four, uh, uh, phase uh, four, step two, um, and then we'll be moving uh, further on May 29th to opening even more. So that's the update for today, Donna. And thanks again for, uh, for co-hosting. Thank you, Matt. Um, it's an honor to be here, actually, and, and to you know help all of you get your message out. It's been an incredible series, and, and it's so nice to hear milestones that are really positive, and that's all you've had to share with us today. So it's really it's a huge breath, not of you know not being safe, but um, as further moving in the right direction. So thank you for sharing that really positive news with us today. 
Okay. I'm going to go back to some quick question and answers um, for our guests. And Dr. Wilson, I'd like to start with you. Um, I'd like to ask you to speak at two points. Um, the CDC has approved Pfizer for um, for our, our children ages 12 through 15, and we understand that that's going to be um, happening soon. Is that available? Is that approved in Massachusetts yet? Um, and will parents need to have any special um, guidelines, referrals from, uh, from pediatrician's offices, anything in order to have their children vaccinated? And then part two, I have heard anecdotally from some parents, they're still not quite sure. They may be vaccinated themselves, but still might be slightly hesitant for children. So if you could speak to those two questions, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Um, my understanding is that uh, now that the CDC has, in addition to the FDA, approved for 12 to 15-year-olds, uh, through 15-year-olds, um, that no additional um, approval will be needed. However, uh, states can decide otherwise. Um, and so I'm not sure what the formal procedure within Massachusetts is, but I can't imagine but that there will be immediate uh, approval and that vaccination should be uh, given without any hesitation. That would be my assumption here uh, because it, again, has been approved as safe and effective uh, and actually more highly effective uh, in, these, in this younger age group in the 12 to 15 year olds. So. Um, and as, as far as not being sure about whether or not it's safe and effective, understandably, parents are concerned about their children. Um, I think the answer to this really is appreciate that fear uh, and concern, but ask them to look at the evidence. And the evidence is very clear. Not only is there uh, safety in, in these age groups, just as it's very safe in all the other age groups that have been tested so far. Uh, the CDC and the FDA would have never approved for these age groups if there was any question at all about safety. But the efficacy is even greater than in the uh, older age groups, as I mentioned. So the safety and efficacy are without question uh, present. And so really parents should not hesitate at all to have their children vaccinated. Remember that it's doing good for them, but it's also doing good for others because they then no longer can be infectious to others. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilson. Um, and now we're going to move on to, uh, to Sarah Cloud. A quick question for you, Sarah. Uh, we've heard about uh, COVID anxiety, and even though people might be um, vaccinated after everything folks have dealt with for this last year plus, that some people are still feeling anxious about even following the guidelines and, and loosening up even a little, could you speak to that quickly and, and how people can get support? Yeah, no, certainly. And I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's absolutely normal and to be expected and okay to, um, to continue to have some anxiety after everything that we have been through together. So I think being able to, to talk uh, the anxiety out um, first, you know, certainly talking to, uh, a healthcare provider um, about your specific situation and your condition and anything that may apply to you. Um, but also I think the more you have uh, social interactions, um, it's going to help decrease uh, your anxiety. And that um, social action interactions don't have to necessarily be in person. You can start slow um, and move towards that, um, you know, re-entry and re-engaging with folks. Um, so it can be via phone it can be uh, via uh, conferencing um, and then into uh, you know physical interactions, maybe outside as the weather gets nice and ease back into it. And I think you know seeking out support um, and talking to uh, a healthcare professional as a therapist um, might also help if some of those um, anxiety continues to linger to try to get some support around that because it's not something that you should live with or suffer continue suffering uh, with alone. Um, there are many ways in which we can address that and get help for you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, that's very good advice. And recovery it takes a lot of different forms for a lot of different people. So it likely is going to take some time for all of us to recover from the conditions we've dealt with over the last year, uh, whether they be physical or emotional. Uh, moving on to Justin Domingos, athletic director at Plymouth North. Um, you talked about the um, the close contact sports and and that the all of your athletes are wearing masks. Um, 
Are there any limitations or any changes in, in physical contact um, during this period of time uh, with COVID? No, so we've seen a, a tremendous shift from the fall when we started playing soccer and volleyball where we had rule modifications, right? They, they took corner kicks out of soccer because they were afraid of you know, large groups of student athletes being clumped together for corner kicks. Um, they made a three foot rule in volleyball where players had to, we had actually put down tape in our gyms and players weren't allowed inside this three foot area near the net. Fast forward after our, our successful fall seasons and our successful winter seasons where we played basketball inside uh, without any, you know, real slight rule modifications in, in hockey with some slight rule modifications to the spring now where we just didn't see the spread. And, and nationally, this was the case. We didn't see COVID spread through um, interscholastic athletics. So right now in the spring, we, we don't have any rule modifications except for a couple of tweaks in wrestling, which deal with just if, if the mask were to come down in wrestling, they, they will stop the competition. They'll reset the athletes and they'll fix their mask and continue to wrestling similar to if, if they had a, a headgear violation. So we, we've come a long way in that. Um, the biggest thing that we stress with our athletes is, you know, what they're doing, you know, when they're not on the fields, when they're riding in cars with classmates, when they're, when they're uh, hanging out on the weekends is that they have to continue to be vigilant because that's where we've seen COVID spread uh, with our athletes when it, when it has happened. And I think that's a good point. Uh, the Plymouth Public Schools have done an incredible job of really limiting uh, spread of COVID-19 in the school system, um, throughout the school. So, And you've been very vigilant at keeping uh, community and family members up to date with everything. And everybody appreciates that, definitely. I'm going to move on to, um, to Scott Fry, Athletic Director at Plymouth South High School. You know, we hear that all of the uh, stadiums that are opening up have limitations for the number of people who can be present. Are there limitations for attending high school sports right now? No, just like Justin talked about in the beginning, um, in the fall, there was be limited to two participants, um, uh, two players, two, I'm sorry, two parents per participant. And now into the spring, we're really, um, the only guidelines that we follow is that we ask that everybody be masked on campus and that it be socially distanced unless they're with family members. So it's really come a, it's come full term since the spring where there was a limitation. Now with everything being outside except for wrestling, we, we do have a limitation there. Everything else is pretty much open except um, as far as being just be masked and being socially distant. I'm sure you have a very lot, a lot of very happy families and uh, and friends of the athletes who are able to to watch them live now. So thank you so much. And moving back to uh, to yeah. Matt, Matt, uh, to revisit the question that I asked uh, the doctor a few moments ago, does Massachusetts have any specific guidelines on when uh, 12 to 15 year olds can be vaccinated? And as that is Pfizer, are there going to be listings on the website as to which um, vaccination sites are offering Pfizer for people to walk in? Yeah, the, the governor will be making an announcement on that shortly. Um, really just waiting for the CDC guidelines and the federal guidelines to come out. Um, and yes, it'll be, it'll be announced and it'll be on the website. And yeah, there'll, there'll be a lot of publicity around that. Excellent. Thank you so much. So now we're going to revisit with each of our guests. Uh, just to have your final comments for the day, I'd like to thank all of you again for participating. You just give such incredible information to our community. It's invaluable. Um, so we're going to go back to uh, Dr. Wilson, if you have any final comments today. Well, I guess what I would offer is that vaccination is now increasingly widespread, which means that transmission risk and new cases are dropping rapidly, but we're not yet at zero. Um, and so we need to continue to try and balance thoughtful prevention and precautions uh, with returning to the familiar and comforting practices that we, that we know from before. Some people are going to be acting as if the pandemic never happened, and others are going to continue to be extra careful for months to come, and, and that's okay. Um, I think we need to all continue to be considerate of others. Um, and let me repeat Sarah Cloud's suggestion. We should all try and practice unprompted acts of kindness. Thank you. Thank you. That is incredible advice. Thank you so much for your time again today. Um, and moving on to Sarah, do you have any final comments or things you would like to share with our viewing audience? 
Yeah, and I think as we you know, discussed and, and Dr. Wilson talked about that the physical isolation has been very, very effective in protecting members of our community from the spread of COVID-19, but that has come uh, with a price. And it is a trade-off that we can counterbalance with outreach and those acts of kindness that we've been talking about. So I just really wanna encourage people to continue to work together to care for the most vulnerable um, but most highly valued members of our society and our community, um, which is our senior uh, citizen loved ones and neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Again, just wonderful messages for all of us to continue to remember, um, even as things lighten up, that we have to be looking uh, to each other, to our family and our neighbors, to ensure that they're receiving the care that they still need to. So thank you so much. And moving back to our schools, I'll start again with you, Justin. Do you have any final comments you'd like to share from Plymouth North High School? I, I do. Just one quick one. Um, you know, it, it's tough being uh, being new to this community and working here and through our first three seasons, having to tell people they couldn't come to games and sometimes having some tough conversations with folks um, when we weren't allowed to let people in. But as Scott said, we're, we're allowed to have um, the community back at our, our home games now. And so everyone's welcome. Uh, just please know that we will ask you to wear a mask on campus and uh, be considerate of those around you by social distancing. So thank you. Thank you for that reminder. And I'm looking forward to, uh, to next season, next year too, to see how things continue to progress. It's, it's going to be, it continues to be exciting every day to see things uh, returning to a semblance that, that we recognize, uh, and especially for our young folks in the school. So thank you. And Scott, any final comments uh, from you from Plymouth South? If you could unmute yourself, please, Scott. We still can't. Um, yeah. So there, there has are. been some challenges. Okay. Yeah. So there has been some challenges on a trying, we are still trying to maintain um, some traditions. We've had some senior athletic awards night that will be in person. We've had a captain's breakfast. Um, so we are trying to get back to as normal as we possibly can while still being safe. Um, I will say that our coaches and kids have been incredible um, throughout this um, really difficult year. And we really are looking forward to a fall season and hopefully a um, normal August where we get everybody in school on time and on the plane. So. Excellent. I, th I think everybody is looking forward to that too. Thank you again for being here with us today and circling around back one more time to State Representative Matt Moratori. Matt, do you have any final words for today? Can you believe it's episode 98? Yeah, I know, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to miss it after. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do on Wednesday <laughs> afternoons at noontime now, but I, I guess I'll find something. To, um, <laughs> Yeah, just, just real quick, thank you to all the panelists today. Just it's, it's always great to hear a lot of positive things we're hearing. You know, one, la one last comment I do want to make too is that 54% of the adults in Massachusetts are fully vaccinated. Uh, there's roughly 5.5 million um, uh, uh, residents in Massachusetts that are adults. So that, that's, that's encouraging to see more than half now are, are actually vaccinated and more encouraging to hear that we're going to be able to do, uh, you know, kids now. Um, so that that's really good news. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do my commercial, Donna. Don't relax until you get the vax. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Well, I, I expect we are gonna be seeing you on all the Boston affiliates in addition to PAC TV um, with your new commercial and PSA. So I'll be watching and recording those so I can play them back for you on PAC TV as well. And circling back around to our touchstone, Ken Tavares. Uh, Chair of the Select Board for the Town of Plymouth, Ken, you have been so solid and, and you have really, throughout this entire process, have been so dedicated to making sure information education is out there. So I'd like to thank you first. Um, but your reflections on, um, on where things are today in Plymouth and, and the changes that you're seeing. Thank you, Donna. Uh, I think it's because we have representatives of the school say that I'll use this as the example. Uh, I compare Plymouth to a team, a team that uh, is, is on the field, uh, has uh, good, good coaches, good support people, good fans. Uh, we have been through so much in the last 14, 15 months. Uh, I don't think any of us could have visualized what we were going to be going through uh, this morning, uh, my wife and I were sitting on our back porch and uh, uh, we uh, were very honest with each other. We talked about the, the highs and the lows of, of the last year. 
but uh, at the end of the discussion, you know, we're in agreement. The town of Plymouth has done well, and it's done well by the people that are represented on this panel today. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was at Plymouth South uh, after class hours uh, for a meeting, and uh, one of, I think one of the directors uh, mentioned it, uh, uh, the kids being out on the field, uh, watching them on the various fields made me feel good. Uh, knowing that we were returning to some sort of normalcy. And I think that's been our goal. Um, we still have things to do. We've got to be careful. Uh, and uh, I know that this community is, is up to it. Uh, we have proven it. Um, you know, we all come from uh, rich history, 400 years of it. And uh, I know Plymouth has another good 400 years uh, in, in its future. We have done well because we have worked with one another. And uh, I thank every one of the participants that's been on the program today because you gave all of us something to walk away with. Thank you. And thank you to Donna and, and your crew for everything that you folks have done. Thank you, Ken. And I always enjoy hearing your words um, on this show each and every week. I'm, I'm in the studio, uh, usually floor directing with Steve, and I, so I get to hear everything all of you say, and I really do enjoy the inspiration that you give us each week. And how wonderful is it in spring, as everything is being re-energized outside and growing, we're feeling that re-energized. Re I'm not going to be able to say this word. We're being re-energized as well, um, just in seeing the changes and the positive direction things are taking. So um, I hope everybody can take that away today, too. I'd like to thank all of our guests today uh, for being here, for being a part of the show. I'd like to thank our crew, uh, Melissa, Max, Nate, Tom, and Mark, uh, for bringing this show to everybody. Steve, thank you so much for asking me to fill in for you today. Uh, good wishes to you and your family and your new grandbaby, Everett Danielle Rosen Trifletti. Uh, this is episode 98. We ask all of you to join us again next week for episode 99. Thank you for being here today. <laughs>